Dearest mother, we went through miles of desolate country. There were gaunt specters of trees standing on either side of the road, barbed wire entanglements in the fields, huge shell holes everywhere, and dugouts all along the roadside. Over here, we are full of business all day and every day getting our work started at Bléroncourt. Tomorrow, we are actually starting off six strong to begin by unpacking our own beds and cooking utensils. At the moment, there is only one little pavilion which is at all habitable. The other has no roof and, of course, we must put up some sort of barackment for our dispensary, our ouvroir and magazine for our extra sleeping quarters for the motor girls. In the shadow of the war, young American women left their home country to come to the assistance of the French people in distress. Little was written about their passage, save a few rare letters found by chance in family attics. Letters sent to loved ones who had remained in the United States. Over a course of seven years, photographers and filmmakers captured their daily lives. These records are as exceptional as they are original. In Picardy, in northern France, the war has been waging for over 900 days. This war of positions, which opposes the German army to the Allies, is ravaging the country in an onslaught of fire, the like of which has never before been seen in the history of mankind. A dozen kilometers from the front, a small group of American women has set up their headquarters in the village of Blairancourt. Driving around in their Ford Ts and Dodge pickups, they come to the aid of civilians affected by the war. Mary Breckenridge, head nurse, recounts. Tomorrow, we'll start early in the morning. One van will head off equipped as a mobile shop with supplies and another with doctors. Here, we still have the dispensary and the office open day and night to receive people. These young women, all volunteers, provide medical care and distribute packages with essential goods to the Picards. Miss Morgan writes to her mother, the other day, our doctor at Blérancourt had an emergency call for a baby that she had heard nothing of at Saint-Paul, one of our most destroyed villages. The baby was born in a trench with a corrugated roof, five people living together, and no light unless one left the door open. Poor Dr. McLaughlin said she had never thought to bring a baby into the world under such conditions. Marianne Bartol, a shopkeeper, recalls. From Blérancourt, we went to Soissons, then along a part of the Chemin des Dames to Fime, where the famous Hill 108 is. Anne and I climbed to the summit and looked into the two craters from the central ridge, which is all that is left of the hill. The Germans blew up one side, burying about 250 French, and later the French blew up the other side, killing 400 Germans. These bodies are all in the hill, covered with debris and much unexploded dynamite. Mary Breckenridge talks about her leader's character. Miss Morgan is charming. She comes bursting in from time to time, very lively like a brisk west wind. She's full of good humor and jokes in the face of all the strange situations that arise. These American women had a mission, to save France from German barbarity. Impelled by an immense philanthropic momentum, they were recruited by an exceptional woman, Anne Morgan. In order to learn more about her, we need to step back into the past. Born in 1873 in Highland Falls in the state of New York, Anne is the youngest daughter of John Pierpoint Morgan, finance magnate. Her father is as much part of the old elite as of the new, where flamboyance and competition in the social sphere reign. It's the Gilded Age. 
At a reception during her teenage years, her father asks her what she wants to be. Anne replies, something other than a rich fool. In The New Yorker, Margaret Leach describes the young woman. Anne's entrance seems to quicken the air of the room. Her energetic presence charges the atmosphere like an electrical disturbance. She knows what she wants done and is concerned only with results. Much has been said of her resemblance to her father in force of mind and personality. John Pierpoint Morgan, owner of the Titanic, is the most powerful man in the United States. An arms dealer turned banker and industry magnate, he buys out his competitors to create trusts and ensure his monopoly. The president and government officials obey him out of fascination and interest. As she comes up to her 30th birthday, Anne Morgan helps found and manage the Colony Club, the first exclusively feminine club which encourages women to come out of their homes and help build a better world. She becomes a women's rights activist. I never had any creative ability. I just had a trudging capacity and God made me a strong physical animal. In New York, 15,000 female workers from the textile industry are up in arms about their harsh working conditions. Anne Morgan supports their strike. The strikers ask for bread and roses, the abolition of child labor, equal pay to men, and women's suffrage. During her struggles, Anne Morgan meets Elizabeth Marbury at the Colony Club. She's the first female impresario and represents George Bernard Shaw and Oscar Wilde, among others. Elizabeth introduces her to her female lover, Elsie de Wolf, actress and interior decorator. The couple distance Anne from her family environment, drawing her into a freedom-loving artistic world where less conventional sexual practices abound. The three women move to France and enjoy their time at the Villa Trianon in Versailles, acquired by Elizabeth Marbury in 1904. Elsie de Wolf writes, The summers at the Villa Trianon before the war were our banner days. Life there was so easy and comfortable, and the three of us lived happily together. The reason for this was, I think, that we were all different, each one having something to contribute to the other two. They are known to all of Paris as the Versailles Triumvirate. On Sundays, guests from all backgrounds come visiting, royalty, armed forces, and celebrities. J.P. Morgan dies in his sleep a year after the sinking of his ocean liner, the Titanic. Wall Street's flags are at half-mast. The New York Stock Exchange halts trading as the funeral procession passes by. Anne becomes one of the richest heiresses in the New World. In the summer of 1914, Anne Morgan is on holiday in Bride-les-Bains with Elizabeth Marbury. But on August the 3rd, Europe falls apart. Elizabeth Marbury remembers... A crier rushed through the streets shouting, war has been declared, war has been declared. Everyone was stunned. For several seconds, our hearts seemed to just stop beating. Everything went quiet, like the silence before a storm hits. Anne and Elizabeth cross France by car to meet with Elsie de Wolf in Paris. At the end of September, after the Battle of the Marne, Anne and Elsie discover the front line. Elsie is overwhelmed. What we saw with our own eyes of the horrors of war touched us so deeply that we resolved then and there to devote ourselves to the Allied cause as long as the hostilities kept up.
Anne Morgan heads back to New York to found the American Fund for French Wounded, the AFFW, an association of female volunteers that supplies hospitals and essential items for wounded soldiers. As she writes in her essay, The American Girl, published in 1915, No human being can be free from a personal responsibility. Side by side, we must work for our sisters across the sea. Filled with the deepest human sympathy, we must give of that which is divine within us, the love which is ready for all sacrifice, even unto life itself. Whilst the women are busy sending packages off to the front, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson declares that he will keep his country out of this worldwide war and refuses to send any humanitarian aid. Anne Morgan shows public opposition to this stance, which condemns associations participating in international aid efforts to act without official backing. Upon her return to France, Anne Morgan, along with her two friends, transforms the Villa Trianon into a hospital for the war wounded. Whilst out distributing medication and clothes, Anne Morgan meets Anne Murray Dyke. Mrs. Dyke, a divorced childless doctor, wants to open a welfare house for refugees in the Aisne region. Anne Morgan falls in love with both the woman and her project. They create a new section within the American Fund for French Wounded dedicated to the protection of civilians. On May the 7th, 1915, a German submarine torpedoes the British liner, the Lusitania. 1,200 people are killed, including 114 American civilians. America is in shock. Wilson will be re-elected in November 1916 on a promise to keep America out of the war. But in February 1917, Germany launches a pitiless underwater war in total contradiction with international law. Two months later, President Wilson declares war on the German Empire. His new stance is clearly motivated by economic interests. The United States have lent so much money to England and France that entering the war is also a way of securing their debts. At the start of 1917, the German High Command carries out a strategic withdrawal behind the lines at Hindenburg and applies a scorched earth policy destroying the land to make it inoperable for the French forces. The Germans leave destroyed villages and ravaged countryside in their wake. A few kilometers from the front line, in the village of Blairancourt, Miss Morgan and Mrs. Dyke set up their section dedicated to the protection of civilians with the help of General Pétain. For the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, this measure helps to prevent the exodus from the countryside around the conflict zone and to keep up the morale of the troops, most of whom come from a rural background. It's here in Blairancourt in July 1917 that Anne Morgan sets off the history of Americans in Picardy. It's also here that the aristocrat's philanthropy is transformed into humanitarian aid. Dearest mother, you can't imagine how interesting it is to be living in the middle of the army this way. We are really getting to feel as if we belonged in it, and the état major that is here are wonderful to be working with. The people now understand we are here to help them, to help themselves. Your wonderful check arrived last night and has thrilled us all beyond words. Anne and I have already spent it ten times over, but have this morning decided to put it into stoves which are desperately needed this winter in every home. To feed the most poverty-stricken Picards, the American ladies set up a dairy farm in Blairancourt with 17 cows.
they organize seed planting over hundreds of acres and replant 3,000 fruit trees. Ford tractors are imported from the United States to clean up the devastated farmland. They replace the livestock that has become a rare commodity. The fund also finances a workshop, employs workers to build shacks christened Les Provisoires, which will allow Picards to remain in their region and to bring this burnt land back to life. 800 families are rehoused in this way. They resuscitate this devastated land. But what motivation does a high society American lady have to join this fund in devastated Picardy so far from comfort? Her determination is cultural and francophile. The elite in the United States have limitless admiration for the country that saw the birth of the Age of Enlightenment and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and feel as if they owe something to France. Over 25,000 women left the United States to join great humanitarian causes during the Great War. 350 of them came to join Anne Morgan. The rich heiress multiplies her trips back and forth between France and the United States, where she recruits the fund's volunteers, young women with no ties. For many of our female compatriots, it's the chance to help show American sympathy for France, a counterpart of the men's enlistment in the armed forces. Other American ladies appreciate the freedom the fund affords them, driving vehicles, repairing engines, traveling without a chaperone, and managing alone without a man watching over. These young women who come from good backgrounds cost the fund nothing. They pay for their own trip, $1,500 for a six-month tour as a volunteer, the equivalent of $20,000 today. They pay $45 for their made-to-measure sky blue uniform, the equivalent of $650 today. They all have to speak French, show a valid diploma to prove their skills, and hold a driving license. Each one has to insure and pay for the maintenance of her vehicle, change the suspension springs, clean the cylinder heads, break in the valves. Now, for your perfectly charming Miss Conley, I had the most satisfactory talk with her in Chicago and found her just as your letter said, for she is just the sort of girl we want. The only trouble is that she cannot go until June. However, this gives her time to brush up well on her French. Meanwhile, we have secured one or two girls in Chicago. In Eastern Europe, the Bolshevik Revolution changes everything. Russia has to deal with its internal issues. Fighting on the Eastern Front ceases. Some of the German troops leave for Western Europe, but most of the divisions stay on site to control the vast annexed territories. On the Western Front, the American troops, the Samis, start pouring into the northeast of France. The reaction is immediate. In the spring of 1918, a German counteroffensive puts paid to all reconstruction efforts and plunges Picardy back into the torment of war. In the countryside, it's mayhem. Civilians are obliged to flee, abandoning their homes. Under enemy fire, the American women have to evacuate Blairancourt. They help the most needy civilian populations to leave. In this chaotic situation, the American Fund for the French Wounded concentrates on its medical mission and dissolves its civil aid section. Miss Morgan and Mrs. Dyke refuse to abandon the population to its fate and create the American Committee for the Devastated Regions of France. Posted as near to the front line as possible, the committee's volunteers care for the soldiers, bringing them food and clothing. In this moving war, the committee's drivers and nurses work all day and night long to evacuate civilians and look after the wounded.
11th of November, 1918. The armistice is signed. The Great War is over. Most humanitarian associations leave the front line. The AFFW decides to carry on its work. No person and no organization could imagine that we are no longer needed. Seeing the French still dying from hunger as they were during the fighting, dying now when all talk of peace is like watching a nation dying for nothing. The shock for some is just too much. They kill themselves. Recently in Blerancourt, a woman over 60 committed suicide. Her husband was dead. Her son had been killed in the war. Not a single stone of her home was left standing. The garden and the trees had completely disappeared. So she hung herself there. In early 1919, Miss Morgan and Mrs. Dyke return to Blerancourt. The couple buys the castle's ruins and sets up the fund's headquarters. Its emblem, the griffin, symbol of courage and speed, becomes that of the AFFW. The AFFW is made up of 55 American women, 12 English women and 80 French women, of which 16 are visiting nurses. The fund sets up five centres, Blairancourt, Anisy-le-Château, Coucy-le-Château, Vic-sur-Aisne and Soissons. At the wheel of their 50 vehicles, the volunteers patrol the villages around these communes, which are set out in the shape of a star. To give you an idea of the extent of the destruction, something that the American people surely have trouble imagining, you can drive for 15 hours along a straight line and see nothing but ruins. The village has been heavily bombarded by the Germans. The sanitary conditions are beyond words, as there are still so many bodies of men and horses that are barely below the surface of the ground. In the brook just outside the door of the schoolhouse, the head of a Fritz had appeared in the water, as the brook had washed away the covering of soil that was over the body. The church and town hall are in a pitiful state. A great many of the inhabitants have returned and are living in the ruins of their former homes. Window glass is very scarce, so they use a waxed, reinforced paper for all of the windows, except one pane, which is glass, so they can see out. The paper keeps the cold air out, but also the light. I'm going to be in charge of the store, and also be marraine of a village, so I think I will be quite busy. Each volunteer is the patron of a village. She meets its inhabitants, evaluates their needs. For Marianne Bartol, it's Saint-Paul au Bois. The shop opens at 9 a.m. It's full of impatient customers, some of whom who have walked 18 kilometers to come and make their purchases. They buy the widest variety of articles, pins, thimbles, a wardrobe, or a gas cooker. Large objects are delivered twice a week with the Ford trucks that travel out to the more distant villages. The Picard, who don't have the strength or time to come on foot, can give their orders to the drivers who deliver them the following week. At the beginning, we gave everything away. Nothing was sold. When the peasants couldn't afford to buy, we gave them goods. That meant that they could have things they couldn't have had otherwise. If the peasants received their war victims' welfare from the government, we sold them certain things at cost price. As I sit here in spite of an overcoat, high boots, woolen stockings, etc., my feet are cold. There is no fire, and the door is constantly opened by some man or woman with a basket on her arm asking for something. Generally, I must call Anne to answer their questions. But I like to see their rosy faces, full of hope and confidence, as they cross the threshold of this office. On Saturday afternoon, a woman came in from my village of Saint-Paul to ask if I would be godmother for her baby, who was to be christened on Sunday. 
While there, I discovered that the baby was an illegitimate child, as the woman's husband had been killed in the war four years ago. This news was rather disconcerting, so I paid a call to the priest to see if it was acceptable for a member of the American committee to officiate in such a case. He listened carefully and finally said, Of course, a case like this is most unfortunate. But France needs the babies, so while the church deplores it, the state is much pleased. However, we can arrange the matter, and as you are not a Catholic, I will have one stand by you and take the vows for you. I was quite taken aback. The illegitimacy of the child didn't worry him at all, but my being a Protestant did. Mary Breckenridge, who was born in 1881 in Memphis, Tennessee, is nicknamed Thompy by the girls who adore her. She gets a diploma in pediatric nursing and gives birth to little Brecky, who will be carried off by a poorly treated appendicitis. Mary therefore decides to devote her life to children and joins the AFFW. She sets up in vic sur where she heads up the visiting nurses unit. My darling mother, Miss Morgan and Mrs. Dyke gave me their consent to set up a baby hygiene campaign in this part of the N, wherein I shall measure and weigh all of the children under the age of six years. During one visit, we met the Duvauchel family. They had no milk for the baby, no eggs, only canned food. The little girl of five is undernourished. It's pitiful to see. The older girl has fainting fits, as does the father, and the mother constantly has toothache. Why am I writing to you about them? There are thousands of others just like them. I must tell you about the dispensaries and hospitals. If you could only see the lines of mothers and their children waiting for the Monday consultations, and the hospitals full of sick people being treated as well as possible, you would indeed appreciate what the committee is doing for the French nation. Splendid work is being done in the way of child hygiene. Now French children are using toothbrushes on their teeth instead of their feet. Miss Morgan is in America at present. I hope that she'll bring lots of money back because money cannot be spent more wisely than here by this committee that knows its work well and that is constantly proving its worth. Many thanks for the official looking letter and all the good news. Everything is going well. We secured $6,000 in Minneapolis at the three meetings, much better than in Dallas. But we regret San Antonio's negative decision and with Houston exceedingly doubtful. Miss Morgan is an autodidact in humanitarian work and a pioneer in fundraising. In 1918, she opens a publicity office in New York, which communicates through over 400 branches across America, and takes full advantage of the impact of images to influence public opinion. She employs artists to photograph and film the fund's works in France. Harry Lackman, a young photographer and filmmaker from Michigan, used to dream of becoming a painter. Charmed by his talent, Anne Morgan orders several hundred photographs from him, which are relayed by the American press and then sold in the form of albums and postcards, with all the proceeds going to the fund. Dearest Mother, I do hope you will get to the office to see the photos that Harry Lackman took there last week. People at home seem to care more about the photos than anything else, as nothing that one tells them is able to give them the real picture. These portraits that praise the French peasant who suffers terribly from the World War, a figure of pugnacity, courage, and the instinct for survival, are greatly influenced by painting. This oftentimes idealized and sometimes caricatured image aims to stir the compassion of the New World and stimulate its generosity for battered France. A filmmaker came from Paris to film all of our activities and publicize them. Really, he worked very well. 
and if the result is good, it should be successful. He filmed me as I was weighing an adorable little girl lying down in the basket, raising her feet in the air. You can rest assured that I know my babies well enough to choose a good actor. These images show the enthusiasm of the volunteers in the field, but the reality behind them is crueler. My darling, the other evening in Soissons just after dinner, I was told there was a critical case of diphtheria in Cousy. It was twin babies, a boy and a girl, beautiful children of 11 months, who'd suddenly fallen ill. The parents only called our nurse the next day and she came straight away, but the boy had just died and the little girl was having trouble breathing. We did everything we could, but around 11 p.m. our baby had given up this struggle. Mary Breckenridge recruits nurses at the Protestant Nursing Home in Bordeaux. They train the Picard women in public health care and social work. The professionalization of women is one of the fund's main objectives. If only the leaders would face up to the ways of the modern world. There are lots of students at dental school in Paris, almost half of whom are girls. Necessity has obliged French women to find paid work, and that's a good thing. I mean all women even housewives that aren't seamstresses or peasants. We're going to organize monitoring clinics for children, transport baby scales in a truck from village to village, weigh the children under six and those in poor health. The most underweight will receive a special diet to get back up to normal weight. For the younger children, we have our famous cod liver oil, but unfortunately, for the very little ones, we are cruelly short of milk. Our first American Holstein cows are also arriving this week, the 100 cows that were promised. It will be a busy week for livestock, for we are also receiving a wagon of 1,000 rabbits and 200 chickens and our much-awaited goats. Thirty more goats are on their way. It really is the most necessary thing for this region. The only difficulty is in getting hold of them. There were plenty at five or six dollars before the war, but now they cost around twenty dollars. I estimate that for every goat purchased, one baby's life will be saved. Dear Mrs. Hunt, I'm sending you a report on the money that your club sent me a few months ago for the purchase of a goat. This priceless animal was given to the Bouzon family in the village of Chavigny. Since we gave them your goat, she has borne two kids. You can easily imagine what great comfort she represents for them. Some animals are brought in from across the Atlantic, but most of them come in from the French countryside that hasn't been touched by the air raids. My dearest mother, I wish you could see how my little ones are gaining weight as a result of what I have done for them. Their mothers eagerly follow their weight gain, comparing them to the standards on the chart and praying for the day when their child's weight will reach that standard. With the help of the farmers' unions, the fund finances the installation of several cooperatives to exploit the common agricultural land. They put forward the funds to create repair shops for agricultural machinery, revive livestock farming and grain production. The expense is enormous. 
What a fruitful collaboration. Our tractors are the great excitement this week, for 25 Fortsons are arriving for us at Soissons. The government goes on promising state tractors in our region, but they do not materialize. This is terrible. So you can imagine what it means to have these actually on hand. Miss Morgan puts entertainment at the service of her humanitarian cause. On the 14th of January 1921, she organizes the boxing match of the century at Madison Square Garden in New York between Benny Leonard, lightweight champion with his slicked back hair, and Richie Mitchell. Celebrities auction off the first category seats. They sell quickly at $1,000 a piece. All of the proceeds go to the American Committee for Devastated France. At the Trocadero Theatre in Paris, Charlie Chaplin presents a preview of The Kid before an audience of 6,000 people. Two short films, produced and directed by the American Committee for Devastated France, precede the film's projection. We have been swamped by photographers and filmmakers, and on top of that, there are various guests who come along to see what we're doing. We are practically exhausted. A filmmaker has filmed our babies again. They'll be child stars. The preview of The Kid is a triumph. Charlie Chaplin gives all the proceeds to the American Committee for Devastated France. At the same time, Anne Morgan organizes the Miss Goodwill Tournament. Middle-class American ladies travel to France to observe the American Committee for Devastated France's actions and financial needs. To obtain this privilege, they participate in the Miss Goodwill contest. 56 towns take part. The voters pay 10 cents to select the committee's goodwill ambassadors. The nominees make a six-week trip to France. They attend elegant dinner parties, gala evenings, visit the Eiffel Tower and the Palace of Versailles, and of course, make a stopover in Picardy. These communication campaigns allow Anne Morgan to collect $5 million, a considerable sum at the time. As to the Goodwill delegation, it has been 100% successful. I know their morales could not have been better. I feel sure they have returned wild propagandists. The war may be over, but it just keeps on killing. Of the billion bombs dropped during the war, some 150 million didn't detonate. Three million hectares of land are declared unsuitable for farming because of the presence on the land of these bombs, mines, grenades, and human or animal corpses. One of the most tragic things is the way people continue to be blown apart by explosives in fields and gardens. It seems there is no solution. When a peasant drives his spade into the earth, it will probably touch a grenade. I wounded last week were three men and two women, and only two men survived. As you drive along the roads, you can see groups of peasants working, working, working to try and cultivate the land that three years ago was embedded with trenches and cannons. We never dreamed that living conditions could be so severe. At first, it seemed to us it was hopeless for France to attempt to rebuild these devastated areas. Workers from the world over come to help rebuild. The only doctor in the district is a black man from Martinique. German prisoners sleep behind barbed wire and grenades carry on exploding in the fields. The mayor of Curve is an earl, whilst the mayor of Domier is a blacksmith. A group of American ladies race along the roads in their truck. Everything has been shuffled up like a pack of cards, and one day we'll wake up and we'll no longer be here. 
Thanks to a superhuman effort all round, Picardy is reborn from its ashes. The committee's volunteers have managed to make a large part of the population self-sustaining as regards food and material, and have organized an efficient health service. They've also brought a new breath of life to the Picards. At the foot of the Coucy le Chateau fortress, blown up by the German army in 1917, the committee builds a library that will be run by Jesse Carson. This librarian from the New York Public Library is nicknamed Kit by the girls in reference to Kit Carson, legendary pioneer of the American Wild West. What fun it is to discover Treasure Island with a French boy. He's enthusiastic about discovering the literature of another country. He finds Kipling un peu bizarre, but Cooper is épatant. These French children read these adventure stories with the concentration of an Indian following an animal's tracks. The library furniture is built in the committee's workshops using planks of wood from the supplies crates and pale wood from pitch pine imported from the United States. It's adapted to all sizes of reader, even the smallest. The books can be borrowed for free. A record sheet is inserted in each book. It's a system that's totally new to France. The children are crazy about the books. The veterinarian reads philosophy. The baker's wife takes out two books a week, her only moments of leisure. Another part of our children's aid program is a small mobile library with French children's favorite books. The library is in a truck that also transports groceries. In 1922, 50 vans called mobile libraries drive through the Picardy countryside. The mobile library is born. It's a first for France. You, Aunt Jane, and Father would be amused by the censorship exercised by the Bishop of Soissons on books for young people. Amused and saddened by this new proof of censorship by the Roman Catholic Church, Jesse Carson asked the Bishop to approve the lists of books for the libraries. Among those he excluded were Gulliver's Travels, One Thousand and One Nights, and Everything by Alexandre Dumas and Victor Hugo. Fortunately, it's the consensus of opinion of the elite and not the anathema of just one of them that determined the choice of books. If reading's food for the mind, then sport is food for the body. In the spring of 1920, during a tour in Texas, Anne Morgan recruits Agnes Doran, a young physical education teacher. The athlete teaches gymnastics and contemporary dance, inspired by American choreographer Isadora Duncan. Our plan is to further increase the children's interest in athletics by holding Fête Sportive twice a year. These competitions are held between the teams of various schools. Such gatherings will help to develop certain social traits of team discipline and esprit de corps, which will be valuable to them later in life. Individual badges are given to the children who have shown physical progress. The Latin race entirely lacks the sporting instinct which is so strongly ingrained in American and English children. Doran, the Texan girl, is one of the most talented and annoying people I have ever met. We were all annoyed with her at times. She is so content with herself and convinced of her own importance that she is hopeless. In the forest around Compiègne, the young come back to their green Picardy pastures. The smell of gunpowder has given way to the scent of daffodils. The committee actively supports scouting and founds the Boy Scouts of devastated France. It also sets up a camp for girls. The teenage girls' lives revolve around open-air activities in an atmosphere of strict discipline. These groups provide an educational framework that fosters physical development, but also hygiene. This week we are starting in the school. Miss Wright, Miss Tuvi, and Miss Hick are starting with sewing and carpentry classes, and the teacher is thrilled as he has no means of doing it himself, and yet realizes that the whole future of the country lies in the very young.
The 20 or so centers of the American Committee for Devastated France in the Aisne also organize apprenticeship programs. The centers also double up as kindergartens so that mothers and war widows can take time out or go to work. Seconded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a team of American ladies is sent to Picardy to teach home canning. As a yellow and white-checked oilcloth is the usual table covering, the white cloth was an important feature. As no one has any good dresses here and gets tired of the sight of horizon blue and the khaki worn by the chauffeur, a favorite way of making an occasion festive is to dress up. One could not imagine a prettier or more animated scene. Some evenings at the foyer are family evenings, which, thanks to a little light and joy, some books and some games, are a reminder of evenings spent at home. The mothers bring along their knitting, the fathers a deck of cards, and the children sing and dance. Every village will have its Christmas tree and its gramophone for music. Some will have a small mobile cinema purchased by the committee. It will be very pleasant. With some difficulty, we found a Christmas tree in the forest of Compiègne. We have had a very busy week with Christmas parties for the children from the villages in our foyer. We had three parties with about 350 children at each one. Tilly dressed up as Père Noël and some of the children were delighted and shrieked with joy at the sight. Others were scared and wept for fear they might have to shake hands with her. My dearest mother, I so wish you could see the gifts I receive from my friends in the Vic district. Among them, are all sorts of shell casings, some of delightful simplicity, others hideously decorated with my initials that stand out like warts. I also have flowers, mistletoe, Pies cooked without sugar or milk, and even eggs from the chickens they had such difficulty getting. The ladies of the committee are no longer strangers from a foreign land, but the villagers' neighbors and benefactors. Their work is done. The American ladies can leave Picardy. A party's organized. Miss Morgan and Mrs. Dyke, surrounded by children, enjoy this last shared moment of happiness. In her last letter, Anne Morgan conveys her emotion. Up there, as you know, we're working hard at closing the American committee. It seems like a first-class burial for everyone concerned. However, you can see from Mrs. Dyke's official letter to me, written by her before I left France, that the Association d'Hygiène Sociale de l'Aisne has been officially created. In seven years, the 350 female volunteers of the American Committee for Devastated France have supported the reconstruction of 130 communes and restored hope and dignity to 60,000 people. The committee donates its libraries and centers to the municipalities of the N. As for the Chateau de Blairancourt, it becomes the Franco-American Museum. I came back to Vic as it was growing darker, along a road so full of memories of loaded trucks and urgent calls. It was my farewell evening, and in spite of my sorrow, I enjoyed the songs that the drivers and young people had prepared. Every day seems to be a goodbye, one after the other, each more difficult than the one that went before. You cannot dedicate your life to an entire nation for three years without feeling the heartbreak of the last goodbyes. shining in Picardy in the hush of the sea of the dew roses 
Piccadilly, but there's never.